my name is Cyril Cormos. I'm executive director of Wild Heritage and a member of the Primary Forest Alliance. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I want to begin, uh, of course, by acknowledging that we are gathering today on the lands of the Ganyan Geha First Nations and uh, in a place called Shokshoke, which is now also known as Montreal. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to quickly introduce our panel um, and then move on to a few quick remarks from me and then pass on the microphone to the other speakers. Um, introducing first down to the left, uh, David Knox, head chief of the Kwakwakiwak and Kwagyoth First Nations uh, from Vancouver Island. Um, David Knox is also a member of the Awitnakola Foundation and also a member of the Primary Forest Alliance. So um, Chief Knox will go last. Um, I will uh, speak and then I will pass it on to Dr. Alicia Guzman, who's the lead on Amazonia for Stand Earth. And Alicia will pass on to uh, Lena Yanina Estrada Anyokazi, who's a technical advisor uh, on climate change and biodiversity conservation for COICA, um, the largest South American indigenous coalition. So. Um, this event is hosted by the Primary Forest Alliance, uh, and the topic we want to talk about is primary forests and their unique and special importance. These are forests which are exceptionally important because they maximize ecosystem services. These are the places where you have by far the highest biodiversity, terrestrial biodiversity on the planet, at least two thirds, probably 80%. They are the places with by far the largest terrestrial carbon stocks, so they are vital for, for climate change. The carbon stored just in primary tropical forests alone is enough to put us beyond 1.5 degrees C and to cause catastrophic warming should that carbon be released. So the amount of carbon stored in these forests is enormous and these places are essential if we want to have any chance at resolving either the climate crisis or the biodiversity crisis and the fundamental point that I would love for you to take away from this event is that those two things are deeply and inextricably linked. That the higher biodiversity and the higher carbon stocks are the same issue. The carbon is higher because the biodiversity is still there and these forests still have ecological integrity. Unfortunately, these forests are going extremely fast. Um, these are not just important for ecosystem services. These are the homelands of indigenous peoples. These are places that provide the cleanest fresh water, that regulate water flows, that protect biodiversity. They are the convergence point for all sorts of the most urgent environmental and social justice crisis we face today. Um, I think uh, another important point that we want to stress is that finance to protect these places is available. Uh, we have long been conditioned to believe that conservation is too expensive and that we cannot afford it. That isn't actually the fact, the, 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 the truth of the matter. Uh, the fact is that we spend probably a trillion dollars a year subsidizing extractive industries, and we spend a tiny fraction of climate funding, less than 3% on forests and even less on primary forests. So if we redirected those two very large sources of funding, uh, there would be enough to support uh, protected areas indigenous communities, local communities, for the conservation work that they need to do um, to protect uh, the planet's primary forests. So we are trying to do two things here in Montreal. We are trying to launch a call for a moratorium on industrial activity in primary forest. These forests are essential and irreplaceable and vital. They, we will not solve either the uh, social justice crisis afflicting indigenous peoples all over the world or the climate crisis or the biodiversity crisis without them. Um, and we are also advocating for clear text in the global biodiversity framework, recognizing and prioritizing the importance of primary forests. Right now we have text which is okay, but kind of weak and refers to intact forests which are not well defined. And I think unfortunately that will not accomplish the goal that we need to accomplish here in Montreal. We will not have a credible global biodiversity framework outcome if primary forests, which are the most carbon dense, most biodiversity rich terrestrial ecosystems on the planet are not clearly protected and clearly recognized. So that's our, our takeaway message. Our, our event on December 10th is at 6 p.m. 
in the Intercontinental Hotel, we will launch our moratorium call. We already have 100 organizations signed on, uh, many more signing on as we speak, and uh, we hope to have excellent momentum at that event. So um, with that, I think I'm more or less within five minutes. Um, I will pass it on to Dr. Guzman, who will speak to a very important initiative, which is uh, Amazonia for Life protecting 80% by 2025 to avoid dangerous tipping points in by far the largest block of primary tropical forest on the planet. Alicia? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Cyril. Um, the initiative Amazonia for Life Protect 80% by 2025 seemed like a bold and uh, unreachable goal for uh, global policy last year when we first launched in September 5th. However, at the IUCN in Marseille, um, while we thought it was an uh, um, unthinkable goal today, it immediately became um, a motion, a resolution of the IUCN. We know now with the science and the data that we've been collecting throughout all this time that protecting 80% of the Amazonia, it's uh, not just feasible, but urgent. I'd like to address uh, that in the data, point, in the data that we have been collecting, when we talk about how are you going to, the, the big question is like, how are we going to do this? How are we going to protect the Amazonia at a level of 80%, um, we need to be aware that a third of the Amazonia are primary forests. And therefore, uh, this is like a, a 270, uh, 277 million hectares that are primary forests. And a, a third of those uh, forests are in indigenous lands. We still question ourselves why not all the countries uh, uh, have already supported and included indigenous territories in any of the texts of the convention. <clears throat> so today, um, I just want to make sure that um, we, uh, together with COICA, our, the partner organization, this is a Panamasonian uh, umbrella organization for nine uh, national organizations in in. Uh, South America that cover the Amazonia. Um, we're trying to make sure that when we are in any of these uh, international events, specifically this one, that the targets uh, for uh, several of the ecosystems that are in danger um, might not apply. In the Amazonia, we talk about uh, a tipping point when we cross a threshold between the 20 and 25 percent. Um, the degradation and deforestation uh, are already in 26%. I just want to make sure that uh, everyone understands this, as this might be the last uh, COP, biodiversity COP, in the last uh, global framework uh, where we can discuss the future of the Amazonia. Um, the tipping point is unraveling savanization, some parts in already in the southeast, Brazil and Bolivia. So um, whatever uh, we think it's uh, just a target, it, uh, it involves um, 847 million hectares and 500 million people. We still don't understand where, why we're dividing biodiversity from ecosystems, from primary forests, and the people still live in it. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead. <coughs> Hola. Bueno, para buenos días a todos y a todas. Eh, como coordinadora de las organizaciones indígenas de la cuenca amazónica, que hemos venido haciendo un seguimiento al convenio de diversidad biológica, eh, queremos hacer la sugerencia, hemos venido haciendo la sugerencia, eh, insistiendo en que nuestro principal motivo y nuestra meta aquí es que en el ten, y teniendo en cuenta que los pueblos indígenas somos quienes resguardamos la biodiversidad o la mayor parte de la biodiversidad y que nuestro, nuestros territorios indígenas se encuentran en riesgo por 
infinidad de motivos dentro de nuestras regiones, hemos venido insistiendo en que en la meta número 3 se cree una nueva categoría que tenga que ver con los territorios indígenas, específicamente que se llame territorios indígenas. ¿Por qué? Porque como pueblos indígenas no nos sentimos identificados con las áreas protegidas ni con las áreas de conservación. Nuestros territorios no son áreas de conservación ni áreas protegidas tal y como se plantean dentro del convenio de diversidad biológica, porque las áreas, este tipo de áreas que se plantean en la meta 3 son manejadas por los estados con reglamentaciones e institucionalidad estatal. Nosotros como pueblos indígenas solicitamos que se tenga en cuenta que tenemos unos gobiernos propios, una institucionalidad propia, que es la que ha sabido mantener el equilibrio de nuestros ecosistemas. Y esa institucionalidad, que hay muchos países que ya la reconocen, debe reconocerse también dentro del marco del Convenio de Diversidad Biológica. Eso es lo que significa territorios indígenas. No somos áreas protegidas, no somos áreas de conservación y se plantea después de esas otras áreas de conservación una nueva categoría que sean áreas de, te de territorios indígenas y territorios consuetudinarios, para lo cual ya hemos llegado a un acuerdo, un consenso global dentro del de caucus indígena o el foro indígena de biodiversidad y es lo que estamos pidiendo los indígenas a nivel global. Nosotros como pueblos indígenas no podemos retroceder en los derechos que ya hemos adquirido o que futuramente o no podemos renunciar a los derechos que futuramente podamos alcanzar. Por eso, esta, este, esta categoría es supremamente importante y creo que es nuestra principal meta en este convenio de diversidad biológica. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Ana. Nugo uh, Am Wallace Namuguis. A hereditary chief from Fort Rupert, from northern tip of Vancouver Island, where I'm from the Kwakwakiwak. There's 18 nations within the Kwakwakiwak. I'm from Fort Rupert, Kwagyoth. There's so much to talk about, but where to start? So it's, it's talking about the old growth right now. And we got British, the, the, the Ministry of British Columbia of the Forestry with is so violating the undripped talking about our old growth, because our old growth is so important to who we are as the people of the land. It's, um, it's, it's so precious because those roots are embedded to the valleys and, and it's so important for our salmon and the roots are embedded and the berries and other medicines and everything lives off those roots of the old growth forest. And it's, it's so important to be able to be able to talk about the raw truth about how do we implement stewardship in all levels of ministries, especially talking about the forestry, because the forest is so important to all, all of the people for the first people of the land. And it's a, it's a global impact for everyone. So it's time to pull up our socks to be able to save our old growth because it's becoming another cultural genocide for our people, all the people around the world. So how do we make so wrong to make it right? We have to heal our lands, heal our waters, and then the people will heal all together and we'll be all as one because it's all about who we are as one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just reiterate some of the organizing points and then maybe open up for, for, for questions. Um, the, the, the takeaway that we, that we want to leave you with is that primary forests are a hyper concentration of critical values uh, for people, for biodiversity, for carbon, for climate change. They are all linked, inextricably linked. We can't solve these crises separately. They have to be solved together. Um, and we are not going to resolve any of the global crises we are facing right now 
unless primary forests are part of the solution. They are not the entire solution. There are many other forests that need protection. There are many other ecosystems that need protection. And so we could talk just as broadly about primary forests, but also primary ecosystems, the wetlands, the peatlands, the grasslands, the other ecosystems that still have very high ecological integrity. Without these places, we have very little chance. And unfortunately, some of the concepts right now in the convention, like intactness, do not capture the importance of keeping primary ecosystems free of industrial activity. And that is something that we absolutely must do if we want to safeguard the biodiversity, the carbon, and the cultural importance, and the cultural resources, and the natural resources important to indigenous peoples and local communities. So these things are problems that find their greatest convergence in these primary ecosystems. Um, and that is a, a crucial, crucial point. Um, the other point is that, you know, we do believe the finance is available um, for the first time ever. We are in a position to say we have hundreds of billions of dollars that could be directed to indigenous peoples and to communities and to protected areas to solve these problems together. Um, specifically, where we are looking for uh, policy change is, is in the targets to the global biodiversity framework, uh, specifically targets one, three, and eight. We feel we need to integrate in those targets the concepts of primary forest and or primary ecosystems, the concept of ecosystem integrity, and the concept of achieving synergistic climate and biodiversity outcomes. Um, the point being, we're not going to solve any of these problems separately. They must be solved together. Um, so I think with that, we have about 12 minutes left. Um, if you have questions, uh, please direct them to the panel. And uh, we do have members of the audience who could field questions as well. And uh, we'll open it up. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Giancarlo Rodriguez. I represent the German Development Institute. And my question, uh, so first to support uh, all your points that you raised, I think that is very important. But I was wondering if setting Amazonia, the 80% of the Amazonia under protection, what it says uh, about local communities that are not in part of indigenous peoples, but uh, campesinos. So how to go about that? That's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. I think what it's important to understand is that 27% of uh, the Amazonia, it's uh, indigenous territories, and 25%, around 25, 26% are already protected areas. That covers 48% of the whole territory with drivers on top of the indigenous territories and protected areas. Not that it does not happen, um, they're completely protected. So the 80% wouldn't be possible, not just uh, with uh, local communities, and governments, subnational governments and central governments, there 52% of the Amazonia's un, un, undesignated land uh, that uh, le lead into conservation. So basically that 52%, half of the Amazonia were people from <clears throat> uh, uh, our cities are going to or local communities and farmers and others. And also the subnational governments are in we need everyone to protect the, to achieve that 80%. Thank you for the question, though. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nicholas King, uh, Wilderness Foundation Africa. Um, we fully support uh, all the points you were talking about um, and that uh, protecting primary forests is a multi-solving solution. Um, the one thing I didn't hear you mention, and my apologies if the lady who spoke in Spanish did mention it, is that the industrial activity in primary forests is also at the forefront of violations of human rights um, and environmental defenders. So protecting uh, primary forests from uh, industrial activity is a biodiversity, climate, carbon, <laughs> and human rights issue um, by preventing those industrial activities happening in those primary forests. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear if you including that as part of the uh, principles behind this initiative. Thank you. 
I'll, I'll just jump in there very quickly to say yes, we fully agree, and that is that is articulated uh, on our website in our moratorium call. Um, if you go to https uh, primaryforest.org, uh, we have a moratorium call posted there, and you know the the disaster of aggression against environmental defenders is clearly noted um, in, in the moratorium. So we, we fully agree. Um, does anybody else want to address that point? Yeah, um, with our nation up in Vancouver Island, um, we did put a moratorium on old growth logging to stop it, but it's our Indian Act system that's allowing deforestation within our nation's area and on we got five watersheds within Fort Rupert lands and lucky we got six percent old growth left and that's what they're targeting right now as we're speaking and it's it's um I don't know it's 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 so dredging to the heart showing the deforestation that's allowed by the ministry of government with industry so that's why I keep saying, how do we implement stewardship within all levels and industry? Oh. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Marissa Colton and I'm with the Financial Post newspaper. Uh, you know, you're, you've mentioned this moratorium on industrial activity on the primary areas of, of the Amazonia. Um, could you could you tell us a little bit more about that? You know what the moratorium would look like, how long it would last, and what role, if any, the private sector would have to play in that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so the the moratorium is articulated as a moratorium until 2050, um, and that's not because we feel that after 2050 we need to start degrading and clearing forest all over again. Uh, the, the point, uh, the reason it was framed as, as a moratorium for the next 30 or so years is that we feel that it is unjust and inequitable to make demands of indigenous peoples, local communities and governments who need to set up protected areas without having the finance in place to make that feasible. So obviously, if we put this uh, request out that we protect primary ecosystems globally and primary forests in particular, uh, we need to compensate for that and the money needs to be available. And traditionally, the amount of money that's been available has been too low. Um, and so we've had to scramble to find alternative solutions. But I think one of the big realizations over the five years, one of the game changing understandings out there um, is the idea that climate and biodiversity are the same issue when it comes, at least in the case, to, to terrestrial land use. Um, and the idea that an ecosystem protects more carbon when it, is, when it has its ecosystem integrity, that the carbon is more stable and therefore safer and at lower risk of being emitted, and that the carbon is longer lived. If you don't degrade a primary forest, it will stay there for millennia, right? If the forest is degraded, might not be there in 30 years if there's a drought or a pest outbreak or a fire uh, or some other some other form of disturbance. So, so the fact that that primary ecosystems maximize your climate benefits and the fact that we're almost out of time on climate change, we have eight years of emissions left at the at the current rate of emissions. Eight years, we absolutely cannot afford to degrade the largest, most stable, and longest lived carbon stocks we have. And they are that way precisely because they have all of their biodiversity. And they are that way because they are stewarded by indigenous peoples and, lo and local communities, um, and of course also protected areas. So these things are intertwined, but that nexus that we are facing now is, is, is a new realization and it now makes it credible and, and necessary to redirect a, a, a lot of the climate funding to these places. Whereas in the past, we were sort of trying to figure out, cobble together ways to protect these places. Now we understand we spend a trillion dollars on perverse subsidies to destroy them, and we don't spend nearly enough from the climate bucket to help protect them. And those two sources alone could get you the vast amounts of money should they be redirected. So to, to come back to your question, getting that shift, financial shift to happen is gonna take time. 
And we can't simply ask for a permanent ban and throw that out there without having any sort of plan to get that financing in place. But we do believe it's possible. And if you actually look at the UK 10 point finance plan that they've issued, they talk about exactly this. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm from Berkeley, California. And so, you know, sometimes I sound a little bit radical, but ending destructive subsidies and, you know, refunneling much more climate finance is in the UK finance plan. The issue is not that these questions are that these, you know, that this is, is a, it's a crazy idea. It's not, uh, it's politically difficult and it hasn't happened yet, but it could. And the other critical point is that it's not enough to redirect the finance away from the negative activities. You still also have to get it in, to the right people. So you have to get it to the indigenous peoples. You have to get it to the local communities and you have to get it to the protected areas if we spend it on planting trees or logging better or on biofuels, then we still won't achieve what we need to achieve. So uh, that's my long-winded response. Thank you. Hi, my name is Arabek Gawin and I'm from the Finnish delegation. Um, you stressed the distinction between uh, intact and primary forest. Could, could you once more explain why? And I'm looking at this from a boreal forest point of view, and I have to explain, uh, you know, and even translate <laughs> what it means. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, intact, colloquially, when people use it in casual conservation, means the same thing as primary. However, in a pol in a policy context, the term intact is not carefully defined. And I think some people interpret it only as the very largest blocks of primary ecosystems left on the planet, rather than some of the small fragments, which are very important from a restoration standpoint and for biodiversity. And also it's not clear whether industrial extraction is excluded from intact forests. When Target One mentions intact forests or intact ecosystems, how are those places actually used? So the language in there is not terrible, but we need certainty because these are the most important places left um, we don't solve any global crises without them they cannot be left behind so we need absolute clarity and that's why we are um, being uh, so so insistent on on this point today thank you Thank you, Virginia Young, and I should clarify, I have been involved with the Primary Forest Alliance for a while and I work on the nexus between climate and biodiversity. And I think to answer the Finnish gentleman's um, point, primary forest is defined by the FAO and it's referenced already in the CBD. So it has a clear um, defined meaning, meaning, whereas intact does not and is open to all sorts of abuse. So that's another reason why it's so critical that we pick up on the past identification by the CBD of the importance of primary forests and now do something concrete to actually help protect them. Um, and that, what that concrete action looks like is supporting the rights and livelihoods of Indigenous communities who are their custodians globally, but also there are some big lessons, if you like, for developed countries uh, like Western Europe who don't have a lot of primary forests left and all the smaller areas of primary forest should be cause for recovery in Europe. Thanks. And I'll, I'll just add very quickly to Virginia's point just to amplify, the, the policy, uh, the, the uh, momentum around primary forests is actually growing, uh, not just because of the CBD decisions that were passed in 2018, but the IPCC Working Group 3 report on mitigation has very strong language on primary forests for the first time linking, you know, the, the, the biodiversity and the climate language uh, together in, in a very useful way. Um, so the exceptional importance of, of primary forests is making its way into the policy world and it needs to make its way into this particular policy instrument as well. It would be absurd to have... Uh, 
CBD general decisions talking about primary forests and the IPCC talking about primary forests and other primary ecosystems, but not the global biodiversity framework. So what we are saying is what is already happening in these other venues needs to be integrated and transferred into the GPF as well. Sí, con respecto a lo que has dicho, eh, creo que eh, es, es importante tener en cuenta que cuando se hablan de bosques y de pronto bosques primarios, eh, no siempre se tiene en cuenta la, la, la diversidad de visiones como lo puede ser la visión indígena y es que nosotros hemos estado siempre en bosques, que la, eh, conviviendo y viviendo en bosques que quizás la sociedad occidental ha considerado que nadie ha vivido allí o que se han mantenido solos. Y esa es la diferencia de nuestras visiones, porque cuando se habla de, de, de conservación, hablamos de no tocar los recursos naturales. Cuando hablamos de sitios protegidos, hablamos de que no se pueden usar, no se pueden tocar los sitios, lo, los, los recursos mientras que nosotros los pueblos indígenas siempre hemos utilizado los recursos, nunca hemos dejado de utilizarlos, hemos vivido de la madre naturaleza, de, de, de la madre tierra y sin embargo la, el equilibrio ha estado allí en, en, en esos ecosistemas, es decir, nosotros por eso hablamos de preservación, más que de conservación o de proteger, hablamos de preservar, preservar la vida y preservar los recursos, que significa el uso y la administración de los recursos. Por eso, si nosotros no quedamos en esa meta 3 como territorios indígenas, no estamos siendo involucrados dentro del convenio de diversidad biológica. Esa es la importancia. Y para lograr la conectividad de los ecosistemas, si se, va a hablar, si se va a hablar de ampliar áreas, tienen que pensar primero en que hay que ampliar áreas en donde también viven personas, vive gente, hay comunidades, hay vida, no solo de animales, sino de nosotros como humanidad, que somos los que estamos allí. Y esos territorios, uno, hay que ampliarlos, o dos, hay que legalizarlos. Gracias. Uh, Chief Knox, any last uh, words of inspiration as we go? Yeah, um, there's, like I say, there's so much to talk about. But um, uh, the, the bottom line is let's let's heal our forests, let's heal our waters, and let the people will heal with it. Let's find those objectives to work together to make it right for the future because it's about the future and about the future generations ahead of us. It's not about us. And people are just cashing in for the moment because red cedar, the old growth, is the highest value it's ever been in the whole world right now, and that's what they're deforesting as we're speaking. Thank you. Couldn't say it any better. Thank you very much for all of our panelists. Um, thank you for participating and uh, we are obviously available for any further discussion or, or questions that you might have. Thank you.